I can guarantee you um, that we could trade names of people or books that we each haven't read um, that will make us both feel a lot of shame. Trust me. It's just, what, 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 it's what's it one is. for you? What, just, just out of curiosity, you only, oh, just, yeah. just one. Sure, here it is, War and Peace. I haven't oh, read it yet. Yeah, neither have I. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. These things are awesome. They are light, sleek, industrial, practical, functional, gorgeous, beautiful pieces of engineering. I have really enjoyed having one over the last year. It holds up to 12 cards plus room for cash on the back. This one has a cash clip. I found it can also hook onto your pocket if you're not carrying cash, you know? This one is the stonewashed titanium model. Very cool. But if you'd prefer something else, there's over 30 colors and styles to choose from, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. The durable material means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You could buy this one wallet and carry it for life. In fact, the Rich team is so confident you'll like it, they'll let you test drive it for 45 days. You can send it back for a full refund if you don't love it. It's a great policy. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com forward slash better than food and using the discount code better than food. The link is below. Thank you so much. Also, I'm selling these bookmarks, which is just my face with a uh, little reminder there. There's some white space on the back here that I can sign, or as it was suggested, I can write you a little message. I can write you a bad poem. I suggest a recipe for dinner. I can tell you what I'm reading right now. I can give you a book recommendation curated to your taste. If you just DM me and let me know what kind of books you like, I'll do whatever you want. I'm your slave. Just buy my bookmark. They are $4 each plus shipping. It's cheaper in the US, but I'm happy to send quotes for international. I don't have a website or anything, so if you just hit me up using the email below, I'd really appreciate it. Or you can DM me on Instagram. And to everybody who's bought a bookmark, thank you very much. Today I'm having a conversation with Chris Villa, the book reviewer, writer, and IT specialist who runs the YouTube channel Leaf by Leaf. It seems we have some overlap in literary taste. He's an extremely well-read guy, more so than myself, I believe. And so I highly recommend you check out his channel if you're getting into serious literature. I'm very glad that there are people like him in the world and on YouTube, and I've been looking forward to this very much. So thank you very much for coming on, Chris. How's it going? Yeah, it's going really well, Cliff. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure, man. Especially uh, exciting because we're we've sort of figured out how to do this in real time. Yes, you're <laughs> you're actually over here. If I was to look over here, this is where you are. So I'm trying to keep onto the camera. But yes, it's a <laughs> this is an experiment, and we're making it work. So we just got five questions for each other, and the idea was to see where it goes. Yeah, sure. So let's start off with this one, which is a completely selfish question on my part, as I tend to prefer shorter books, whereas you, I believe, tend to prefer actually longer ones, more, more challenging longer ones. So you're able to tackle these enormous novels with, with real pleasure. Admittedly, sometimes it's uh, kind of a slog for me. Do you have any advice for long reading sessions? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're right. I think that ever since I started my channel uh, not too long ago in the summer of 2019, I got a reputation as someone who loves big, dense, maximalist novels, uh, you know, and I've been asked this on a number of different occasions, of course, and the best way that I can ever uh, come at this thing is to use the analogy of a relationship, and it seems to have worked really well to describe both, or at least to try to describe maybe psychologically why it is that I gravitate toward these uh, towards reading as an extreme sport, as I've heard it put. I have a video that I created uh, a while ago uh, on how to read big books, you know, with some different uh, like tips or and tricks or something like that for approaching them. And so I'll just kind of summarize some of the points in that video here. Um, first of all, I would say that, you know, think about what it is you want to get out of a book and out of your reading time. You know, maybe maybe the big books just really aren't your thing and you should be okay with that and never let anybody make you feel otherwise. You know, I think that uh, in the literary space, there does seem to be this elitist echelon um, that has kind of set these standards and these rules that you know, if you really want to call yourself a reader, you have to have read this huge punishing novel and this huge punishing novel. No, so not at all. No, never, but, never. Yeah. Where'd you get that idea? <laughs> I, it was a dream I must have had or something like that. I don't know. Or I heard it from somebody, you know, 
a friend, a friend's asking, <laughs> but <laughs> I want to say that's even though I love those types of books, yep. you know, this, this should never, we should not let these things be divisive. We have enough divisiveness in our culture. So let's, let's protect our book community from it. Nevertheless, there is some kind of strange appeal to the big book, you know, the big dense book. Um, and for me, you know, I've gotten a taste of it, seen that it is good, and I've never been able to stray, at least not too far. Uh, so tip number one is to look at it as a long-term relationship that you're about to get into. This isn't just a blind date uh, or a dinner or a one-night stand. This is, you know, you're going to be living with this person for a while. So you need to kind of use that mentality of commitment. You know, this is going to be your world and you're going to be in a conversation with it. You're going to spend lots of time with it, just like you would someone, you know, with whom you're trying to establish a serious long-term relationship. There's going to be a history there that you're making. And so it's true with long books. I think we all know how, um, for some reason, uh, us readers, we can sort of look at books on our shelves and pinpoint exactly where we were when we were reading them at a given time. So there's there's a really strong uh, connection, a really strong emotional and soul connection, um, and it's it's taken to even greater heights with the big book. So that's my first tip. Mm -hmm. Come at it like this is a long-term, exclusive, monogamous relationship that I'm about to enter into with this book. <laughs> The second one, I would say, uh, don't try to read anything else along with it. Um, I'm a chronic, simultaneous book reader. Likewise, even when I when I tell myself, you know, I'm only going to read this one. Oh yeah. Somehow with yeah, somehow within two weeks, I'm reading seven books. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yep. Uh, At least, uh, right? That struggle is real, like most definitely. So the the second uh, tip I would give is to make sure that you can commit to reading the first. 50 pages. People yeah. like this rule because it's more of a practical and uh, applicable rule and more concrete than the first one about getting in the mindset of a long-term relationship. Yeah. Uh, but the reason is, you know, it takes about the first 50 pages for some of these books. It's really the first 100 pages, but I found that being able to make sure you don't start in on one of these big books, unless you know that you can finish 50 pages uninterrupted, uh, it really goes a long way because usually within the first 50 pages, you start to get in touch with the tone and style and some of the major themes of the writing. And it gives you enough um, of a taste to kind of get your uh, hooks into it, you know, versus just sneaking in a couple of pages uh, on, the, on your subway commute. That's just not going to work with these bigger volumes. Yeah. The third one is uh, I would really... I would really encourage this for any reading time of any book, but banish all devices, all screens. Now, how do you do that? Because I've, I've tried everything from turning off my phone, putting it in the closet to like literally locking it up in my mailbox, dude. <laughs> like for real, like, like it's a, the phone is, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I suspect it's, it's actually much more of a problem than, than I'd like to admit. And that we'd all like to admit that's my intuition at least. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the phone, even when we've put it in a drawer or somewhere, it's like it beckons to us even more loudly <laughs> or something like that. And I mean, we're all human. So uh, when it comes to desire, what I've always found to be true is that when uh, in the absence of desire or especially uh, when you put restrictions around it, your need for it becomes even greater <laughs> when your access to it is yeah. obstructed. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. So, so, so what do you, so what do you, are you able to tell us like what you, what, what you actually like do with the phone or, or are you actually strong enough to just sort of like, I'm going to put it, you know, like not even turn it off, but just like put it on do not disturb and like put it in the other room or something or, or what do you do? What's your process? Yeah. So, so two things, first of all, yeah, it has to be in another room. You can't yeah. have it anywhere nearby. Yep. Uh, and uh, the second rule is uh, to go ahead and preempt that justification we give ourselves for having our phones in our reading space, which says something along the lines of, but I may need to look up a word really quickly. And the internet sure has made that easy. Well, I, as I've said in another video on my channel, um, I really favor printed dictionaries and printed printed thesaurus. Oh, great That's suggestion. more for when I'm writing. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but I mean, it's, uh, the same, it's the same problem when you're writing, though, I'd imagine. That 
Yeah. And so this, this one definitely applies. Like if I'm writing, this is another reason why um, I always write all of my first drafts in longhand. I still do that. Um, I guess from where uh, I was born right in the mid eighties. And so I remember school when it was all, you know, pen and paper. And that's how I learned to write was longhand. And I think that that's part of it, but also that helps me really get rid of everything is if I'm going to write same way as if I'm going to read, um, I do it longhand and without the need of any connected device and really, uh, printed dictionary, uh, is a whole other topic I could go into. Um, just the, the love for, um, the way dictionaries are put together and, and certain ones. My favorite is the American heritage dictionary. That's the one that I always have with me when I'm reading. Um, but there's some, there's something about it that gives a, a pleasure that, and you do start to, um, dismiss the phone more and more, but you have to start thinking of it as, uh, what Mircea Eliade would call a sacred space. Your reading space is a sacred space. That should not be contaminated <laughs> by, by technology or something like that. But I mean, have you ever read a dictionary, like just like sat down and read the dictionary? I never did that. I wasn't one of those kids who did that, but I think, I think they exist. Uh, I'm not going to claim it because I have never read one from like cover to cover as I would a novel or something like that. Uh, but a sort of fun fact is that uh, I remember very clearly uh, in seventh grade getting, uh, detention. And when I got detention and showed up to the classroom, the, whoever, the detention teacher, I guess we would call her. I don't know. She wasn't really a teacher. It's one of those ad hoc people they get. It's like the gym, the coach, and they put him in charge of <laughs> detention. Yeah. But, uh, prison guards, prison guards. There we go. Uh, the, the punishment that they were giving all of us on that particular day was to copy out entries from a dictionary. And you were like, fuck uh, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I was really quiet. You know, I really stifled my joy. And on the outside, I made it look like it was a punishment. But, you know, that, I think that's actually, though, where it started is being forced to do that. Um, I really took note of many, many more things than just the definitions, but also the etymologies. And that became very, very interesting to see how so many of our English words you know, come from other languages, Germanic languages and Greek and Latin, of course. But I think that like early on getting detention and being forced to copy entries from the dictionary uh, sort of gave me this weird mm, neurosis. Hmm. Like OCD? <laughs> yeah, maybe something like that. Oh, I got that it's shit. I got that like in spades. Comfort. It's almost like a comfort. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, did it did a uh, well, I was going to say like that kind of like negative, positive reinforcement. Like it's, it's, it's a wonder you didn't turn out to be like such a terrible kid after that. Because yeah. <laughs> you turned out to be a very, very yeah. nice, a very nice person. Cause with that kind of negative reinforcement, <laughs> like you would have been like, yeah, hell yeah. And then you're getting like brilliant after, uh, just getting in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It's one, it's one of those great ironies that uh, worked out in my favor ultimately, I believe. But anyway, the very last tip I would give is just to commit to knowing that you're not going to understand everything in the first read and that the, the secret and the ugly truth of reading big books is that you cannot only read them one time. That's sort of, nobody really likes to hear that, but. That's brutal, yeah. that's brutal, but that's, that's I yeah. totally agree with that, 100, 150%. Yeah, so, so these books are typically made to be reread and that's where the returns on your investment start to come in is really on the rereads. I've had the pleasure of rereading several of these thick tomes here recently, and it's like reading a completely different book uh, and you get so much more out of it. But so you're committing again, and that goes all the way back to uh, the, the analogy of the long-term relationship as well, because you know, you don't, you're not just having uh, a weekend fling with this book. <laughs> this, you're, you're probably in it for, you know, uh, many, many weekends. Man, that never occurred to me before. Like the, uh, the idea that, you, you know, you're, you're really reading a different book every time you reread that. Yeah, it's like the pre-Socratic philosophy from Democritus of Panta Ray. You can never step in the same river twice. And maybe, or maybe that did occur to me, but, but you know, what's interesting is that it's the same way with people, whether that's your spouse or, or your parents or whoever. 
or your best friends, you're you're not having a relationship with one person, and they're not, and not, and, and it goes both ways. They're not just having one relationship with with you because both of you change. So you're you're having a relationship with multiple mm. people if it's really long lasting over a lifetime. It's just it's just interesting. That's a, that's a great point. That that is interesting. I haven't, you know, I haven't considered this, you know, in the context of many different big books, because I, I see them as you know one at a time relationships. But you're right. Over the span of your life. Um, it's all these different relationships and you change as well. That's probably been the most amazing part is reading books like infinite jest and the recognitions and gravity's rainbow, you know, at different times in my life with a good five to 10 years in between. Um, really it's, it's remarkable to see the change in the book and the change in yourself. Yeah, completely, completely. I, I think that's, that's a great point, but that, so that's it for my, for my uh, spiel on big books. I think that's terrific, man. That's a, that's a ton of really good advice. I really appreciate the insight. And I'm sure a lot of people out there do as well, you know, and I think those, I totally agree with those uh, tips and techniques, essentially. I think those are, I, I stand behind those firmly, 100%. 100%. So how about you? Uh, let's back it up a little bit and get more in a foundational question. And let me ask you, why do you read? To kill time. <laughs> You know, wasn't that what like Newt Hampson said to to somebody? Annie Dillard was writing about that in Holy the Firm, and that's what Newt Hampson said to somebody when uh, they asked why he writes or something. But um, mm -hmm. it's you know I'm still figuring it out. I think I think I always will be. Um, that sounds like too vague and pretentious. But I mean it's like it's like something it's something like um, to kind of like experience the joys of of people while actively avoiding them. That's, that's, that's actually a pretty good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like curating a social life with, with like, you know, like the most fascinating characters, uh, who exist and have ever existed, who happen to also be like extremely articulate or something like that. But I mean, it's, you know, it's like in a journey of discovery in, about yourself and, and the world around you. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, but especially now, you know, it's, re it's really something, it's difficult to, to answer in one way because there are, so like we were just talking about, some, like just distraction. There are so many, there are more things you could do with your time now maybe than ever. Although that's debatable given the conditions we are currently in. Sure. Um, but... Uh, in theory, pre-pandemic, you know, uh, you have the ability to do such a plethora of different things. Like, you know, so why would you, why would you read? But I think it's, I think it's something like that. And also, like, I think it has something to do with the limits of, of one life. And Welbeck, you know, Michel Welbeck, who's one of my favorite living authors, said something like, and I, I apologize if I'm butchering him, but he said that basically the reason for reading or the interview he did for the Louisiana Channel, he said that uh, basically the reason for reading is that uh, one life is insufficient. Like one life is not enough. Mm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. 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 I thought that was just absolutely brilliant because it's true. It's like... Yeah, I think, I think about... Uh... I think about uh, Milan Kundera in The Unbearable uh, Lightness of Being. And, you know, that's his novel where he takes on Nietzsche's notion of the eternal return. And Kundera is uh, very aggressively and assertive, assertively uh, taking the position that, no, there is no eternal return. We only have one life. And so because we only have one life to live, he talks about how it can become... Uh, you know, disastrous for us when we start really trying to think about the things that we want to do, because it's not like we have many different lives to go and try out things and yeah. see if they work out or not. You know, we only have this one. So, you know, oh yeah, it's almost like books are the loophole in that books do give us a way to maybe live and try out a different life without, without question. I, I think it's the closest thing to it. Um, and it, it, it's not like other media too, because you're assimilating it. And I've talked about this in a video about reading a while, a while back. You're literally interpreting symbols on a page. Mm. You're making them your own. You're constructing 
the vision, so to speak, in your head, it's very, very personal. It's not like a film. You're consuming a film and you're, you're consuming various other media, you know, <laughs> like YouTube videos or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's very different, and that's why I don't think audiobooks are reading, <laughs> because it's a completely different sense you're using. But, you know, nothing against audiobooks, it's great, but I don't, I don't think they're reading. Anyways, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention, which was this uh, other literary... Um, there was a podcast called Sherd's Podcast. Uh, do you know that guy? Oh, yeah. He, uh, yeah, he just uh, posted, I think, his first video yesterday. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. And then he tagged... Uh, Coincidentally, he tagged you and he tagged me. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I think I think that guy is great. Uh, I'm so happy for him for starting a YouTube channel. And uh, he said something great in that video. Uh, literature is an antidote to goal-oriented thinking. Oh. And I thought that was pretty much perfect. I don't know. I think that's that's as, as close to perfect as you can get. It, that kind of that answer kind of makes me think of one of my favorite lines from. Uh, the German romantic philosopher and poet Novalis. Um, and he said simply that poetry heals the wounds inflicted by reason. Yeah, that's good. We, we'll make some really deep and profound faces right here. Well, I'm, I'm doing my best. No, but I mean, like, it's like fucking, like, that's, I, I think on a gut level right now, that's, that seems accurate. I mean, of course, that's, that's really, kind of difficult that that's slippery territory to get but i think oh, i think sure. that's definitely true do yourself a favor please and go subscribe to uh shirts tube i believe is his channel name on youtube uh he's terrific with uh shirts podcast he's absolutely worth your time yeah i suspect he's going to make some great videos on there so please uh check him out this wasn't part of our questions but poetry poetry for me has always been f far more difficult than literature and it's something that i wish wasn't the case mm-hmm have you ever read uh, Leaving the Atosha Station by Ben Lerner? No, you know, I have not read anything by Ben Lerner. Uh, I, I don't know why. Uh, I just haven't yet. I thought the cover was dope, and I read 1004, didn't care for it at all. Just started uh, <laughs> Leaving the Atosha Station the other day. Uh, it's excellent. It's so good so far. And I'm only on like page 30 or something. It's terrific. I just, it's oh, about okay. the, this guy, this, this poet over in Spain who's kind of having this, um, it, what seems to be sort of like a kind of a crisis because he's, he's not experiencing art in the manner that's profound enough to to like you know uh how would i say it he's not having the profound art experiences he was expecting you know the the these pieces mm. he's seeing in the prado museum are are doing like uh, almost nothing for him so mm. it's uh it's interesting yeah that i i think that's uh definitely something that a lot of people can relate to i mean i can't even count the number of times i've heard someone who goes to, to read, say, Don Quixote for the first time. And, you know, within the first 10 pages, they're like, why is this such a big deal? Like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> why, why, right. do, why are all these people having, you know, this great experience, this magical experience? And to me, it's just okay. But yeah, I'll have to check that out. He, he is the one who did the Topeka School, right? I think so. Uh, I'm going to check out the book you're talking about, though. You've piqued my interest. Yeah, same author. Yeah, The Topeka School. Yeah, I think this was his first novel, so I just started uh, reading that, and I'm definitely going to uh, okay. do that soon. But yeah, it's, it, I, I can highly recommend it. I think my mom had like a 100-page book rule, you know, similar to your 50-page book rule, and, you know, that was that was usually a pretty good metric for me, although 100 pages is... is can, can, I mean, 100 pages of Gravity's Rainbow is like... <laughs> Yeah, it's like a month. That's a that's like a hundred <laughs> Thanksgiving meals. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, seriously. In your opinion, you know, should you stop a book if you don't understand it? And I've argued in the past for folks not to if they get at least something from it. But I mean, let's 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 be real. I mean, it's like uh, I think you said that Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit was the most difficult book you've ever read. And yes. I can't. I can't. These days, in my 30s now, with, with mortality sort of uh, starting to uh, uh, become a factor, I can't, you know, with good conscience, uh, uh, maybe give the same rules such as that as I was in my 20s to people, or, or, or give the same suggestions, rather. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, I think that is a great question, and it's another one of those that I get all the time from people. Um, and I think before answering it, I think you have to... 
uh, answer a different question first. And that question is, why are you reading? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what, it, what are you trying to get out of reading books, your reading time? And so if you start from that, then the answer to should I, you know, abandon a book if I'm not getting anything out of it, the answer to that will change. So for example, if you use reading, you know, simply to, for catharsis, you know, then, and you're not getting anything out of the book and you're using it just because you want to be entertained and kind of disconnect uh, from the grind, so to speak, then yes, the answer is absolutely, you know, toss it out the window and grab another one. If, however, uh, you uh, uh, are thinking of being what's termed uh, and kind of, you know, frowned upon a serious reader or, you know, because this is kind of rub shoulders with elitism and so on. But if you're the way I like to think about a serious reader and what that really means uh, for some people, anyway, for people like me, uh, being a serious reader means that you're very, very interested in uh, observing and analyzing the entire conversation of literature. And by conversation of literature, I mean the, you know, conversation that books have with each other, so to speak. And so from, you know, the ancient Greeks all the way up to present day, you know, then the answer is no. Because first of all, if you are coming face to face with that question of should I uh, ditch this book because I don't understand it, then that means that you probably knew going into it that it was going to be a little bit challenging. Um, And in which case, Uh, If you look around the landscape of this conversation of literature, and especially in uh, the spaces of academia and the spaces of criticism, and it's like a, let's say, gravity's rainbow, um, where it's not going away, (laughs) you know, it's, it has firmly rooted itself in that whole conversation of literature, then if that's what you're after, then no, you really can't abandon it, maybe temporarily put it aside. Uh, and go get some, you know, go get the uh, Gravity's Rainbow Companion from Steven Weisberger, um, and then go back. Uh, but in that case, no, you you actually have to wrestle with the classics. Now, that doesn't mean you should beat yourself up or think uh, something, you know, like everybody else is getting something out of this. Why am I not doing it? Or set these weird rules that sort of pop up, like if you consult secondary literature, you're not a real reader and stuff like that. That's not true in any way. A great reader will continue to read outside of the book. And so with a, with a, books like that, it's inevitable. But I will say that there have been times when I just cannot connect with a book. It's not so much that I'm not understanding it as much as I just cannot connect. And it gets to the point where every time I sit down to read that book, I almost groan. Yeah, <laughs> any, can, any that you, you yeah. care to mention? Yeah, sure. And I've mentioned this before. Uh, The one that always comes to mind is Thomas Wolfe, Look Homeward Angel. Um, Now, here's the cool thing is that I read that book and I remember just slogging through the first 70 pages until I finally said, I this is boring me to tears. I cannot connect with that. I'm putting it aside. Well, when I did that, there's something about me. Uh, I'm a finisher. I'm a completionist. And, uh, you know, so if I start in on a project and sometimes I think of reading certain books as projects, there's something that drives me and I have to finish it. If I don't, it will weigh on me for the rest of my life. And so uh, Wolf's book sort of haunted me for many years. And then I finally decided, you know what, I'm going to sit down, start back with page one and see what happens. And wouldn't you know it, it ended up being one of my favorite books, one of the best books I've ever read. (laughs) And uh so the, the answer there is, you know, just kind of feel it out. If So three, three answers. If you're coming to books for entertainment and to just enjoy the act of reading, you know, and having your imagination sparked and getting lost in that reader world, and you're not getting that from your book, sure, go ahead, you know, put it aside. It's okay to stop reading it. Pick something else. If you're trying to see what all the fuss is about, um, you know, and, and you want to really engage at that level, that more critical level with books, um, then yeah, you've got to, you've got to tough it out, but no one says you have to do it just because you've started reading a book at a different, at a given time. You can always put that aside and come back to it after secondary literature. So yeah, it, 
my answer is uh, the dreaded answer a question with a question and just say, what is your motive for reading this book? And let that drive whether or not you should plow through. Totally. I hope some of that made some kind of sense. <laughs> no, I think it was, I think it's excellent advice. I think it's exceptional. I, I don't think I think I don't think we could ask for a for a, for a, a better answer, really. But speaking of you know reading all these different books and pressing through and seeing what you get out of them and uh, and weighing that and considering that, you know, why Cliff do you feel compelled, as I do apparently, to come here to YouTube and share that with everyone else? Yeah, I, I don't have a great answer myself, so it's a little unfair that I'm putting this on no, you. No, <laughs> no, I, I, but it's like those who can't teach or are too lazy to uh, uh, to go into to academia to become a teacher, they uh, they go on YouTube. You know? But uh, that's just uh... people go back and look at some of my uh, Q and A videos. I actually answer a question about uh, why don't I have a PhD yet? And there may be a lot of truth in what you're saying about the <laughs> the failed academics resorting to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude. Uh, I mean, on a, on a gut level, I feel that the more people who are reading actually good books, actually good books, in general, the better their lives will be and and that will inspire others. Yeah, completely agree. I don't wanna have any kind of too idealistic notions that it's going to uh, heal the divisions of <laughs> contemporary society. It won't. You know, I don't think reading is necessarily going to save us. It might though. You know, I don't have anything to teach anyone really, you know, uh, but if I can inspire them to go and read books that resonate with them, you know, uh, or, or to not be afraid to go and really pick up some of the intimidating, really, or, or, or strange or like challenging, probably would be more, more, more my case is really kind of like the darker stuff because I think <laughs> over, the, over the years, that's really what's, what's the, the prevailing theme uh, for my channel has been, which is just um, the really strange, unusual stuff. I saw that. Don't don't you have a video that's even dedicated to answering the question of how in the world you manage to read so many depressing books? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, and it's true. Like you know, uh, when when I kind of like aggregate all of my absolute favorites, it's usually uh, the ones that are absolutely most about you know um, uh, death. That's the prevailing dominant theme, <laughs> and I'm fine with that. Sure, because I think confronting that realm of things leads to. Uh, a kind of intuition about how you want to live, actually. Yeah, that's the hope, at least. I've noticed, too, that with a lot of the um, high literature uh, that I've read that really just sort of seems elevated, when you distill it down, uh, it's typically about grappling with our mortality. Seems to be the, you know, common theme around all of them. Well, no, I, th I think that's uh, that's pretty that's pretty succinct and, and just uh, totally accurate. But also, you know, going back to the original question, I mean, it's like um, if I can get people to read books that resonate with them, if I have any influence at all on that, you know, I have the feeling that they'll do the same for others. And mm. you know, so yeah, with the channel, as far as that goes, like after a lot of um, you know, after a lot of validating feedback, you know, people saying that that's actually, you know, kind of like what's happening, it's, it's changing yeah. them positively, you know, that's been, uh, that's been very satisfying. So that's, that's basically why I do it. And also, you know, it, from just like a practical standpoint, you know, I can't, well, first off, I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> I'm completely unemployable at this point. I'm, I'm kind of just, uh, uh, you know, this, this was, this is what worked. This is kind of just what stuck mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> Uh, although, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, I couldn't imagine uh, uh, a position I'd be happier in or a job that I'd, that I'd enjoy more. So, so I'm, I'm thrilled about that. But, you know, yeah. from, from like a practical standpoint, if I'm able to save anybody any time in their search in kind of, you know, like, you know, if I can get people to the book that's going to change them for the better faster, you know, then yes. I'm very happy about that. You know, if I can, if I can save yep. them any time at all, then, then I'm really thrilled. And uh, that seems to have been the case. Uh, that's, that's what I'm assuming, that's what I gather at least. So I hope that's true. 
it's, it's basically the one job I've discovered that I can stand. And uh, <laughs> I've, but, but you know, that it, it, it's, it only is a job because of the, the, the kindness of strangers who became friends. And, and I've met so many unbelievably interesting people kind of always amazed. I don't know. It's something like yeah. that, you know, and I, yeah. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful to them, you know, incredibly grateful. So, yeah. So thank you very much, everyone for allowing me to do this. And you do it uh, very well. Oh, thank you. Uh, you. You and I have talked uh, on the phone here and there, uh, and we've traded stories about how there's sort of, uh, in different ways, there's mutual jealousy or mutual envy in yes. our lifestyles. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> But yeah, you do you do this very very well, and I mean I'm thrilled to have discovered your channel. You've introduced me to books that I had never heard of, and and ended up liking very much. So and and I think it's the same for me. There is a thrill um, in being able to share something like that with others. It's you know um, like it's almost like an analogy I could give it may not be the best, but it's the one closest at hand. Uh, is it's almost like you are a starving homeless person who has found a place to get food. And so, you know, you can't help but want to go and lead others who are like you to a source of food, to a source of nourishment. And in the same way, you know, as, as a reader, if you find something that's a source of, source of nourishment and you know that there are other starving readers out there, it's almost like your duty, you're compelled or impelled to say, hey, here's, here's where you can get some some sustenance. And the same goes like for you, dude, I'm going to discover, like going back through your videos, I know I'm going to discover all these terrific authors. I mean, I've already discovered authors. Uh, I've, I've reviewed Annie Diller recently. That was from you. Yeah. And I'm sure I will discover many more uh, along the way. Uh, so, you know, it goes both ways, but also, but I'm, uh, the, the, the jealousy I feel for, for Chris is that, you know, I, I tried my hand at programming uh, a couple years back. Chris has been uh, in in computer programming and software uh, since you were fifteen. Yeah, yeah. And so you have this whole like professional career that is just really cemented. And uh, I am unable to use the the technical side of my brain if that's a uh, if that if that is actually how it is divided. I'd love to I'd love to have the right mindset. But uh, I, yeah, I, honestly, after after experience, I think it's uh, it's safe to say, I'm not a technical guy. But Chris somehow is able to manage this equilibrium, which is kind of just unbelievably impressive to me. So, hats off, you know. I'm totally jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Chris mentioned that the, uh, the this is a great segue because uh, for some reason, like I didn't think of it, but <laughs> but but one of the questions I had. I had written for Chris was, uh, uh, how has your background in computer programming informed your reading? Yeah, and that, and when I got that question from you, uh, it, it hit me that I've never thought of that before, and no one's ever really asked me in that way before. Usually, you know, um, technical stuff, uh, mathematics, computer science is seen as something totally other and separate from the humanities, and especially the fine arts like literature and, and writing. Uh, and they're seen as sort of mutually exclusive. And so normally when people uh, think about me and kind of having a foot in, in each side, they usually come at it like, how in the world did this happen? How in the world did you go from, you know, computer guy to, to literature guy or whatever? Um, and, but I'd never seen it put the way that you put it, where thinking about how has the one actually informed the other? And when I started really thinking about it, uh, it was like a moment of epiphany. Uh, it you really helped me uh, with this self discovery oh. that I had never had before. That was my uh, my realized, pleasure. Yeah, so thank you very much. And I realized that when I read, I tend to um, get almost uh, neurotically focused on every single element of uh, the book. So, you know, from the cover to the binding, the actual production and design of the book as physical object. But then also as I'm reading, the way that the words, the sentences appear on the page, um, even down to the syntax, you know, did this, in this sentence for this author, why did they use a semicolon here instead of a comma? 
you know, down into that level of thinking, you know, why did they, why did they only put two rhetorical questions in this paragraph instead of the more typical three? And, you know, when you ask me that question, that actually helps answer some of where that uh, obsession with analyzing the text on multiple levels comes from. And it comes, I think, directly from uh, a long career of programming, because in programming, it's all about syntax. Yes. Uh, to the point where, you know, a, a single punctuation mark, be it a colon or a semicolon uh, or, or a, a quote, a quotation mark, if one is put in the wrong place, it could completely crash the whole program. So there's a lot at stake with getting things just right. And so as you're writing code and you've got, you're usually creating an algorithm to solve a problem. And so you've got this problem, this case in mind, and you're writing code and you're operating on many levels because you're thinking procedurally, which would be more like plot trajectory in the literary world. And you're thinking, okay, what steps need to happen to achieve the solution to this problem? You're also thinking on the syntactical level of, I need to get all the prose or code just right. And so, and then of course, inevitable bugs will pop up. Then you have to get, you have to enter an even deeper level of scrutiny because now I realize, oh, something's wrong. It's not immediately apparent what I need to scrutinize line by line and kind of turn on a debugger and step through this code and do things to figure out what may be throwing the error. And I think, you know, after um, nearly two decades of be operating on that level, that now I see that it that has inevitably informed the way that I read. Um, and so, you know, you could say that this is a little more uh, robotic than human, <laughs> but yeah. uh, it works for me because I'm kind of doing both. Like I'm examining the syntax, the way the sentence is constructed, the punctuation that's used, you know, because uh, there are great writers who achieve great style by breaking the rules of grammar. Um, John Updike comes to mind. There are a whole plethora of postmodernists that come to mind, of course, because it's a lot about bending the rules in postmodernist space. But even with, you know, Cormac McCarthy, mm -hmm. he oh, yeah. commits sentence splice error after sentence splice error. And a grammarian, you know, uh, could be uh, hospitalized at the end of reading one of his books. Whereas for me, it is uh, uh, one of the supreme pleasures of my reading life. Is, it's the is best. Being able to read Cormac McCarthy, right? <laughs> Blood Rain is the best. It's just... Oh. Uh, yeah. There first one I read was uh, The Road. Still haven't gotten that. It's on the shelf back over here. Still yeah. haven't gotten that, yeah. That was my very first one, and I, I happened to read it before it became a movie. And, Good. and I actually bought it at a bookshop in Sweden on, when I was getting ready to go to the airport nice. uh, on, my, on my way home. And I ended up finishing the thing while sitting on the tarmac. The plane had a delay, so we sat there for a couple hours. But I was so uh, engrossed by this writing and his style and his voice um, that I read it all before the plane even left the tarmac. So uh, if you'll forgive me the joke, I always refer to that book as being written by tarmac mccarthy nice there you go were you in the were you in the stockholm airport uh actually it's uh near gothenburg this oh i be, hadn't, hadn't been so, to that one. okay okay yeah other yeah. side of the coast and it's funny because people from stockholm and people from uh gothenburg they sort of look down upon each other <laughs> it, it's it's actually a really funny thing it kind of reminds me of northerners versus southerners here on the east coast in america but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. To give people a little distance and yeah yeah <laughs> They turn on each other. <laughs> right. I'm really thankful for the question because you really yeah. helped me discover some of the source or the roots of the way that I read, um, which, uh, you know, a lot of people think that I'm this extremely fast reader, mm. um, but I'm actually not. I actually read about 20 pages an hour is my uh, typical speed, whereas a lot of friends that I've talked to um, they say it's they're more in the forty to fifty pages an hour. No, for, not for uh, me. No way. I think I'm I'm far closer. If not, if not, my page count might be lower than yours. It, 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 it depends. It yeah. depends on the book, though, right? Of course. Exactly. So again, phenomenology of spirit. <laughs> that that may have been five pages an hour. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. I mean, Gravity's Rainbow was five pages yeah. an hour, yeah, that, maybe. But that's, in, uh... it's like half an hour, maybe. Maybe maybe ten pages for an hour. 
probably yeah. actually for me. Yeah, no, like no, really. I, I even if that sounds embarrassing, that's that's got to be that's got to be the truth, uh, or just about. It, it was really quite a quite a challenge, and I could really only take that one in five page increments, and sure. uh, and I really want to reread it. That's that's just such a all encompassing, brilliant, brilliant book. That's actually one of the funniest books I've ever read. I should I should have asked you that question, which was which which authors uh, make you laugh the most, or which books? Yeah, Pinchon would definitely be up there, especially Gravity's Rainbow. Yeah, it's so fucking funny. Oh my god. Yeah, I, I watched your video when it came out here at the the beginning of the year. Oh, thanks. Um, and uh, I like that you pointed out, you know, all, when people would just break out into spontaneous singing. And, <laughs> I mean, people would sh- like pop out of nowhere with instruments and maracas, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, do the doing the can can, and then all of a sudden it's just back into the plot. Yeah, the pinch on because it's good to note how funny the book is because it gets a rap as being this you know monolithic, impenetrable book of profound seriousness. That's but so bizarre to me. He's in the high and the low. Oh of, yeah, of comedy. He's he's all over the place. Oh, completely. Yeah, and he's like he he's a genius, but he's such a yeah, he's such a sure. ham, and he's it's it's hysterical. I mean, it's really a genuinely funny book. That one in Fear and yeah. Loathing by Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter S. Thompson just oh, makes yeah, me yeah. crack the fuck up. Oh <laughs> yeah, so funny. Uh, and yeah, I mean, Gravity's Rainbow is. I can't think of another big book that comes as close as Gravity's Rainbow in terms of how much is packed into each page. Oh man. And I'm really thinking through, through this. Um, because I mean, you know, and his, it's a very episodic novel. So it's each of its four sections, uh, is divided into episodes. They're unlabeled. They don't have titles. Um, and the number of episodes, of course, for each section correspond to stuff he was studying at the time. Um, it's just how he is, but you know, Thomas Pinchon, what amazes me about him is in order to just write a four page episode, he will do what normal people, he will do the amount of research for those four pages equal to most people's uh, PhDs in history. Yeah. It's, it's really remarkable. (laughs) It's incredible. Very few authors who would just completely remove themselves from any sort of um, public recognition you know, it's, yeah. it's a very genius move on his part, I think. I think he just... I agree. He had a really, really good intuition about just how god-awful that whole machine is. And, and uh, uh, that's brilliant. So, you know... I, I totally agree. And, and for, for anyone who reads Gravity's Rainbow, uh, by the time you reach, I think, maybe around page 70 you'll very quickly, and especially by around page 200, Mm -hmm. you'll see why this book would never make it today. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Especially from someone in the spotlight. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah, I think, and I think that was, uh, yeah, it was, it was totally the the right move. I'm not sure if he would ever be able to, to get away with what he did actually have a public persona. So, and not, not being published by Viking, that's for sure. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> or paint right. or random house these days. Uh, just as you've asked me how uh, programming has informed my reading, uh, I know that you started off uh, as a film student. Uh, I can't remember if you were actually studying like film history or film theory, or if you were studying to be an actual filmmaker. The the technical aspect, yeah, studying to be a filmmaker. Yeah, I wanted to be a director. Okay. I really, really yeah. wanted to be a director. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, how I'd be interested to hear how you think that that uh, background may have informed the way that you uh, come to books when you're reading. More knowledge of the narrative structure traditionally, I think, you know, the three act structure in films and so. Mm-hmm. But, but, I mean, eh, maybe that doesn't, that doesn't really bring much to the table as far as like having more knowledge about literature. I don't know. It's a, uh, there's tons of filmmakers who have been influenced by literature, and so you, mm-hmm. inevitably I would sort of like hear about, um, you know, various books that had uh, that, that directors were inspired by, and uh, that whole um, kind of a uh, rabbit hole is, is a lot of fun to like find out what uh, somebody's favorite artists, you know, 
love. You know, the the books that somebody's favorite directors love. Yeah. Uh, same same with music, really. You know, a lot of musicians have great taste in literature. Yeah, that's interesting. But I mean, other than that, maybe like an aesthetic vocabulary. But but it's it's tough. To, I'm sure there's probably something else. But they're, they're both mediums of storytelling. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, you know, I read like Henry Miller before I entered film school. I read like uh, yeah. uh, *Tropic of Cancer* and uh, and I had read I think I had read *Paradise Lost*. And uh, but I you know I don't think I had really gotten it, <laughs> when I, but that was when <laughs> I was a teenager. Uh, but I just yeah. thought it was uh, amazing. Uh, but so so that was kind of it, literature was sort of around pre-film school, but when I was in film school, I think I read 2666 by Roberto Bolaño, mm. and that was really the, oh, yeah. the real gateway drug, where it was like, <laughs> I... It's a remarkable book. It, it, yeah, yeah, I totally agree, man. It, it's, and, and from there, you know, oh yeah, that's what happened. Uh, I would just meet people, and I would kind of like pick up recommendations. This one guy gave me uh, Dirty Havana by Pedro Juan Gutierrez, and then maybe he also gave me Ask the Dust by John Fonte. I'm not sure. But then I think he also gave me Journey. Oh, no. Somebody else gave me Journey to the End of the Night by Salem. Oh, yeah. And then from there. Oh, yeah, but then, you know, Roberto Bolaño gave me Borges. And once I got yeah. Borges, you know, like that was like fucking. It was off to the races. I, for my final student project, I did. A, you see, this is. It was, it was kind of already there. I think I was doing an adaptation of Roberto Bolaño's short story, The Return, for my final student film. Um, oh, very which, cool. Thank you. Yeah, it, it shall never see the light of day, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but my producer on that film uh, recommended Story of the Eye by George Bataille. And yeah, I, I remember the first time I read that. Where were you? What, what, what was that circumstance? I don't think you could ever forget reading that book. Um, I actually read it. It is one of the very, very few books that I read on a screen um, because of the fact that I've been in, uh, you know, the computer field for almost all of my life. Um, I, I like to take as many opportunities to get away from the screen as I can. Um, and so for that alone, I prefer reading, you know, book as a physical object with leaves. Definitely. And, uh, but the story of the eye, I cannot remember. The funny thing is I can't remember how I even came to know of it, but I ended up just, I was at work one day and I was just searching for it, uh, just Googling for it. And I found a PDF of the full book, um, in English translation and, I actually sat there and just started reading it and could not stop. And I actually sat and read it at my desk at work. This must have been 12 years ago uh, in, in one sitting. I mean, I remember there were times when I was holding my breath and didn't realize it until after a while and then had to like catch my breath. And uh, I had to use the bathroom almost the entire time, but could not get out of my seat. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's a short book, um, but whew. anyway, sorry for that uh, digression. No, no, no. It's very interesting to hear where people have read that book for the first time. I was reading it in, in yeah. the Pals Cafe in public, I think, and I was laughing out loud the first time. And, it, and the, the, you know, yeah, I thought it was it was completely ridiculous. I love the difference in our reactions to it, because I, for me, I was I was horrified. <laughs> oh, I was laughing so hard, dude. Or I, I, I think at least I remember. I, I think I was. Yeah, I, th I thought it, the, the the real seriousness of that book really dawned on me because I read it half. I read half of it in the Cafe of Pals books in Portland, Oregon. And then I got on a plane and I went to go visit my mom in Tokyo. And then I was over there for like three months, sort of uh, really isolated right after graduating uh, film school. The, said film school now is completely gone, by the way. So that entire like oh, wow. chapter of my life. There's no physical marker of that anymore, which is very, very wow. strange. So it's it's interesting, odd, yeah. Yeah, it's an odd, it's an odd thing. I and and film film changed so much while I was in school, and then subsequently about the next five years afterwards that I completely became. I hate it now, <laughs> like I like I really, really, really hate it, and yeah. uh, uh, it's it's <laughs> awful because you know I I never watch movies with my wife. It's really it's really terrible. I'm a terrible husband, but uh, I, yeah, it's a, 
Yeah, I really wanted to make that into a film though, but it's just it completely, I was absolutely way too late. It would have been, it would have been far better in the 70s or something like that, you know, but anyways. Um, yeah, but I got isolated in Japan reading that book and then that whole thing kind of unfolded and then I fell down the Batai rabbit hole and that one is very deep and it continues to be fascinating to this day with all sorts of, of um, you know, offshoots and paths you could go down, right? Yeah, the only other, uh, I've read his book on Nietzsche and I have read Literature and Evil. Yeah, yep. And there's one other, let's see, it's on my shelf somewhere i talked about it at one point is it called the impossible yeah yeah i i would recommend eroticism that's yeah that's the big one i was i was completely bewildered by uh the impossible i'm pretty yeah. sure that's what it was called i think Maple i was too Seed. i think that, that one did that one have the poetry in it i'm not sure yeah it, it's been so long i don't know why i can't see it literature and evil i quite liked but i mean mm -hmm. it was you know, it was a pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the impossible is impossible to find right now. Um, but it, <laughs> no. I just remember being so bewildered by yeah. that book. But and then the on Nietzsche. So what is the one that you recommend though? Uh, eroticism ero or eroticism right. makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's magnificent. So is the accursed share his theory of energy expenditure and and I think political economy, if that's the right phrase. Incredible. The notion of the sun is this this dying. Uh, uh, star generating energy uh, until death, you know, constantly giving, taking nothing in return. Absolutely fascinating. Interesting. It sounds uh, like something Pynchon would exploit for a 700-page seven, book. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's incredible. And then Guilty, his, uh, his diary during World War II is very, very strange, very experimental, dark, very emotional, very poetic. Definitely need to reread that one. Yeah, he's got he's got a bunch of good stuff, man. His fiction is is not as good as his uh, his other writings, in my opinion. Uh, Story of the Eye really is the only one of his uh, fictional books. I mean, no, there were a couple of other ones that were pretty good, but Story of the Eye is easily his best, uh, and I think it was his first. So it's kind of like this explosive moment for him, or something that, and nobody yeah. knew he was the author until after he was dead. You know. <laughs> uh, which, you know, actually, that, that brings me into another question. Oh, yeah. Uh, which would be, uh, do you find that too many authors are appreciated after they're dead? And if so, uh, why do you think that is? Yeah, that's a really easy one to answer. I do think that a lot of authors, especially major authors, are appreciated uh, long after they've passed away. And honestly, I think this is because the best artists really we could we could just more make this more general and just extend it to artists instead of just authors um, but most artists are by nature visionaries and if you're a visionary then you know it sort of implicitly means that you're going to be seeing things ahead of what the collective consciousness in our culture is ready to take in so, you know, the, the collective consciousness uh, is always, there's always a back and forth uh, between the people who produce art and the people who consume and engage critically with art. And they shape each other. So as each generation of consumers, um, you know, starts to give feedback about the experience, that is informing the next generation of artists and so on. Um, but the artists have to come first, right? So uh, the very first artist, you know, who's uh, drawing on a cave wall, you know, the person seeing that can't be ahead of them. The person seeing that has inevitably to be behind them temporally um, to give, to actually look at it and spend time with it and start to produce uh, meaning from it. Meanwhile, that artist is probably on to different things. And since, you know, the one has to come before the other, it makes sense to me why some of these great writers, um, it takes so long for them to get discovered because they're putting a new level of visionary work in front of a generation that's still finishing up understanding the previous generation's artists' work, if that makes sense. It seems like hopeless, <laughs> but, but it's also, I, I totally agree with that. that. That definitely seems the most accurate 
answer I've come across for that question. Yeah, and that's why uh, I think that also goes hand in hand with why uh, certain artists who, you know, there's this uh, stereotype of the Jackson Pollock of painting, you know, um, or the Emily Dickinson of poetry, let's say, where the, I would say the highest form of artist has complete, has no even real, um, capacity for caring about who reads or takes in their art. If that makes yeah, sense, right, the, right, right. the highest level that we have, like the Emily Dickinson's, she, you know, sort of against her will published a handful of poems and then completely recoiled from the whole thing. And she realized, you know, she's not, she's compelled to write almost, you could even say doomed yeah. to spend her mortal life, uh, engaging in her art for the sake of engaging in that art, who cares who's seeing it. And, you know, so that's why you see that at the highest level, um, you're getting artists who have sort of already accepted the fact that they're not going to get recognition in this lifetime, but that's not what they're in it for. No, that's that's not, and it, and it isn't. It doesn't even seem to be uh, as much as of a choice, so much as kind of a curse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Rimbo, Kafka. Yeah, Kafka. That's a great example because for me, Kafka will always mean one story to me, and that's the hunger artist. No, oh, I haven't read it. I got to read it. The, it's 10 pages long. Yeah, it, it, it goes right along with what we're talking about. Um, yeah, the hunger artist is, is, will forever be <laughs> synonymous with Kafka, regardless of, you know, reading. I, I love Kafka. I've read a uh, short fiction, of course, Metamorphosis, The Trial, The Castle. Um, but it, it will always be uh, the hunger artist. And that is a depiction of exactly what we're talking about right now. No, I can't, I can't wait to read it. I, I definitely want to, uh, I think everybody who's listening who's interested should take note. For sure. I'll definitely be reading that one soon. I got the trial on the shelf and I still haven't read the trial. It's embarrassing. I haven't done, I think I did In the Penal Colony, but uh, I haven't done any Kafka other than that. It's actually, it's kind of criminal. I, I really, I feel guilty about that. So I really, well, which is appropriate for Kafka, right? <laughs> so. I can guarantee you um, that we could trade names of people or books that we each haven't read um, that will make us both feel a lot of shame. Trust me. <laughs> just, what, 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 what's what's one is. for you? What, just, just out of curiosity, only, oh, just, yeah. just one. Sure, here it is, War and Peace. I haven't oh, read it yet. Yeah, neither have I. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, so I know that this question is very, very daunting. Uh, and once again, I'm so glad I'm asking you this question and not the other way around. But <laughs> nonetheless, for you, what is the difference between a good author and a great author or a good book and a great book? On some level, and it's, uh, it's subjective. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe that's already obvious. I mean, it always is, though. You know, it's, it's always subjective. But on some level, it has to cause a, a, a visceral reaction in me. Uh, usually that's um, uh, through uh, whether or not it makes me cry. Hmm. Uh, it can it can be whether or not it makes me laugh, or you know, but and it's not just just causing a physical reaction. That's not it's not just that simple because you that can be manipulated, you know. But the, it has to hit a certain part of myself that's like I can only describe it as kind of like being deep within the gut mm. that's um it's gonna sound like pretentious but it's like primordial or something it's like some, something that i don't understand something you can intuit when something is huge like it's like it's like it's like big it's you you don't understand it but it's the gravitational force or something the, the profundity is there and yeah. even if that's something that's just making you laugh. Like, I mean, that's kind of like seemingly light, but you know it's not. Um, it has to inspire that kind of, yeah, so like I'm doing, like I'm kind of floundering right now, it has to kind of inspire that 
reaction that I can't put into words. Yeah, you know, it's funny that we just we just stopped talking about Kafka mm -hmm. because Kafka uh, has this great way of explaining. I think what exactly what you're getting out, and he says that the best books are the ones that wound us. Yeah, and I, I think that's just perfect because, like you're saying, that visual visceral reaction. Yeah, yeah. There are certain books that just make this impact or leave you maimed and wounded yeah and you'll never you'll never recover right right absolutely yeah you're changed for for better or worse you know uh i mean you know curiosity did kill the cat so that's the interesting thing about reading because you know it's like yeah it's like we can we can say like yeah we're doing it for for <laughs> for for positive good reasons but the but the truth of the thing is that like um you never know what kind of pandora's box you're opening when you when you read powerful literature I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you know? yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. I, it's a perfect answer. Oh, thank you. Thanks, man. I mean, I, I'm curious, I'm curious for you. Is it is it somewhere in the same in the kind of the same realm or definitely. I mean, for me, uh, reading for me is primarily an aesthetic experience. And so I'm actually I'm not primarily reading to better myself. You know, yeah, I, I, likewise. I guess unless I'm reading Montaigne. Um, even Montaigne for me is still an aesthetic experience because he was such a gifted writer and he knew uh, all of uh, Roman and Greek uh, or Latin and Greek literature inside and out, you know. And there's something about a guy who got to live out his days cloistered in a library in a French chateau, you know, that lends some romanticism to it. But I think for me, it's, you know, it's primarily an aesthetic experience. Yeah. Even though aesthetics is, you know, it's the branch of philosophy that's sort of um, all about defining what is beauty or what is beautiful. You know, what we initially th what might think is beautiful, uh, a given book may introduce a completely different conception of what is beautiful. That, that's that's the best when, when and and when you feel it right away and even if you have like a strong exactly. negative reaction to it I'm I'm very interested when that happens, that's that's a really good indicator that that you're onto something actually. I agree. I completely agree. So yeah, I, I honestly don't have anything that I think if I tried to add to the way that you've expressed it um, would disturb uh, what we've put out there because I think it's it's perfect. And for questions like these, I like to leave it uh, more in a speculative and introspective space instead of going into comparing a, a concrete author to another or a concrete book to another um, because like you said it is very personal that that bloom went and, and uh, created the Western canon and all of that it's it's yeah <laughs> kind of incredible you know really hats off to him just for sort of sifting for curating you know because it's a tremendous amount of work that man has done i haven't read montaigne by the way but but i i i think i got the idea of the reference <laughs> just just a confession yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh but i should though so yeah that's we're, we're we're coming down to the last question here which is uh sure which would be mine which is uh which is actually like um uh, a, a completely practical question uh, and again you know completely selfish <laughs> uh, do you have a recommended reading chair for long sessions I do and uh, selfish question or not I get that question all the time that's awesome and it's a good thing because uh, at some point you know it's maybe not important when you're a teenager or in your 20s because you know your body's very resilient but at some point in your life, if you are a reader and you're going to spend a lot of time reading, sitting and reading, uh, and you know that this isn't really something uh, that's a passing phase that's going to go away, <laughs> yeah. then the reading chair is extremely important because, you know, yes. it's important to take care of your body and uh, set yourself up for success. So when we were uh, building the house that we currently live in, and I was designing this library here, um, it occurred to me that my uh, $40 Ikea chair probably was going to look a little bit funny in here, <laughs> and it was getting pretty ratty, um, and it's really actually starting to make my back hurt a lot after, you know, for sessions, if I sit and read for four hours straight, um, I could really tell, and um, so I did a lot of research 
um, and a lot of going to different stores and actually sitting in the chairs and so on. And, you know, because the thing is with a good reading chair, you don't want anything too comfortable because you'll fall asleep, or at least I will. Um, at the same time, of course, you need it to, you know, be ergonomic and be easy on your body um, and not, you know, like a church pew. Mm -hmm. um, so what I ended up landing on was a chair from West Elm. And I, don't, I, I can send you the link if you want to put it uh, in the description of the video or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I'll include it below. Mm -hmm. West Elm has a chair called the Lucas Swivel Chair. It's actually right here. If I get out of the way, uh, you can kind of see it there in the corner. Um, but it's just a simple, well, simple uh, minimalist design, um, nice leather single chair. And I don't like uh, to use an ottoman. I don't like to have my feet up when I'm reading because I found that that in, induces uh, narcolepsy almost immediately. That's the one when you finally come to the point where you realize, hey, I'm going to spend a lot of my life sitting and reading, then for me, that West Elm Lucas swivel chair is the best uh, investment. Hell yeah, man. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to definitely be looking into this. I might, I may take that recommendation personally one day because yeah, it's, it's about... It's about that time where one starts to feel it in the back, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to your 30s. Ah, oh, Christ, yeah. Aging. Have you ever talked about how old you are on the channel or anything? I think you have, right? Oh, yeah, it's it's something I, maybe maybe I, con maybe I unconsciously or consciously avoid sometimes, I don't know. No, I'm, uh, I'm 32 and uh, born, in, born in March, so. Uh, uh, I think you've, you've got a couple couple years on me, four years, three years, something like that. Yeah, I'm 36 and I'll be 37 in August. So next month I'll be 37. Well, a happy early birthday to you, man. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. The vagaries, is that the right word for the vagaries of aging? The, maybe the agonies. The agonies, <laughs> the agonies of aging. Yeah, aging's a bitch, man. And I'm, I'm not even, I'm not even in the thick of it yet, but you know, somehow we'll get through it. I, I'd say, you know, the gym is a very good thing and yoga too. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for, for readers, really. I mean, it, it may seem polar opposite, but but truly. Oh, I agree. I was thinking of making it, a lot of people ask, how do you find so much time each day to read? Uh, and I thought about uh, just putting together a video with just clips of me reading while doing different things throughout my day. And uh, the treadmill has actually become one of them here recently. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I got I got one right in front of the computer here as well. Yep. I can't run and read, but... Um, no way. I'll usually read for like the first 15 minutes while walking briskly and then put the book aside and get my run in. Walking is, is terrific, man. I think, I think that is honestly, you know, like a low impact steady state. That's where it's at, you know? Yep. I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I have one other, uh, in your opinion, why does modern literature suck in comparison <laughs> to, to everything that's come before it? I mean, I mean, truly there, there really does seem to be, um, it, it's uh, slim pickings. I'll put it that way. This is just self, this again. This is just selfish, but this is just for me. You know, this doesn't have to be public. I'm just curious. So I, I was asked this, uh, and I included it in my fourth Q and A video here recently. Um, it was given to me a little bit more specifically, um, and they were basically saying uh, they were pointing at some of the black humorists of the 1960s American canon. You know, so yeah. John Barth and Robert Coover. Um, John Hawks, William Gaddis, um, people like that, and basically saying, why, why don't we see people of that stature anymore? And my answer there, after considering those types, is that, you know, I think we, at some point, and it goes back to what we were saying uh, when you asked me about uh, why are writers appreciated after they're dead, it isn't just, you know, it's this give and take of the artist producing material and the consumer, I hate calling us that, you know, cause it hints at capitalism, but the, cons the reader, you know, takes it in, the critics give the feedback and it's this loop. Um, and because of the way that that is and that cycle and progression, we will, I, I honestly don't think we ever will have uh, a John Barth again, you know, um, we're never going to have a Virginia Woolf again because they're products of an era 
Um, what's so amazing is that they still give us so much, even today, with our contemporary sentiments. You know, there are just some of these artists uh, over time uh, have just somehow managed to uh, rip themselves free of, you know, their temporal bonds, so to speak. Just being uh, candid. Please. I agree. I, I have the same thoughts all the time. You know, I, I look at the stuff that's constantly coming out and I read through it. I read through book notices and glosses and stuff like that. And, you know, it seems like every time I do take a chance on some new bestseller, um, and I'm not talking about like commercial blockbusters. I'm talking about even like mid, mid level independent and mid level publishers bringing out a, a lauded literary text. I'm more often disappointed than I am fulfilled. Oh, me too. And I have to constantly wonder, is it because there's a certain era in the past that just is getting at something that I need more than what's happening today? So, you know, the problem's on me. And, you know, earlier I gave an answer that was basically saying that today's readers aren't ready for today's writers and especially the visionary writers. Maybe. And so because that was my answer to that question, it almost is now turned back on me and implicating, you know, me uh, or I as not ready for a lot of these books that are coming out. And that doesn't sit well with me because that kind of makes me feel like that I'm missing something when everything in me feels like this is insufficient. Yeah, that that it's the literature that's missing something. Right, completely. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. I agree with that. You know, I, I grapple with that a lot. And, you know, what I've found for myself is that what's happened is I I tend to read way more books by dead authors than by living authors. Oh, likewise, definitely. I, I read I read far more dead authors than I do living authors. And the living authors who I read seem to be certainly uh, in middle age or, or past, you know, I, I, aside from Ben Lerner's book over here and, and even now he's probably in middle age, you know, I, I read no young authors, none, zero, yeah, absolutely yeah, none. none, none of my own generation. That's for sure. I think my generation personally has been ruined. That's it. That's exactly how it is for me. That's how it is for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause I'm thinking, I'm thinking of books that have come out like in the last year that I really did connect with. And, you know, the names are like Ricky Ducournay. And, I mean, yeah. Ricky Ducournay has been writing all through, what, 70s, 80s, 90s. So yeah. it, it's never someone who's, yeah, like you say, never someone of my generation. It's always someone older. And, you know, there are other aspects of it, too. Uh, people just aren't reading today like they were. No, they aren't. A yeah. hundred years ago. Yeah, so I true. mean, yeah. there was a time when people were rushing out to buy uh, Ulysses. And, you know, the common man or common woman was going and reading uh, James Joyce or, you know, uh, William Faulkner and even on their commutes to and from work. Uh, and that, you know, that just isn't happening anymore. And that inevitably sways the hands of big publishers because, you know, they've got to make money. Without question. Yeah, the money, the money thing. Same thing with film. Same same problem with film. Sure. Yeah. Uh, maybe they're actually quite quite related. You know. So. Eh. It is what it is. Well, I know we're down to uh, the last question, and one thing that I was thinking about, uh, especially with uh, Sherd's podcast uh, and Sherd's podcast uh, YouTube channel just starting. Uh, I know there are a lot of people out there uh, interested in possibly starting a YouTube channel or starting a podcast. Um, and specifically about the books they're reading. And so, you know, one thing that uh, comes up a lot is not only just the logistics of how to do it, but really how to approach reviewing a book. This is sort of a, uh, I've seen what we're doing here on YouTube referred to as the video essay. Um, and I've seen heated debates about the legitimacy of video essays of literature. <laughs> and, uh, um, but as, you know, it's actually a good way to think about what we're doing. We're coming out of our reading experience uh, and we're pressing record on a camera and we are creating essentially a video essay. 
um, to, to, for others to watch. So in terms of going from that experience of being isolated with a book that you're reading, uh, and in that, that deep, um, sort of hermetic personal experience with the book to then coming out of that, how do you approach translating that experience into this video essay format? I mean, I mean, if it is, if it is in fact video essays, if that's what, what my stuff falls, falls under or, or people think it is like, I feel like yours, you know, would get, you know, if we were in a class, people, you know, you would get an A and I would get like a C plus, maybe, maybe just a C or a C minus, <laughs> you know, cause it's like, it's really, my, my approach is so casual, dude. It's like, um, I want it to be relatable. Like we're going to, you know, cause what, it ha there's a basic structure of everything. There's a little bit about the biography usually comes from like Wikipedia or, you know, various articles, just kind of like an aggregate and, uh, or just various ones that I can find. And, uh, and then the stuff that I feel is actually quality in the reviews because, because I just write it how I would talk. You know, it's just, it, I, I write them all. There's a script that I follow, but there's also points that I've, I've placed in there where I think I can just spontaneously riff, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and those are the moments which really turn out to be the best. Usually I think, and there's no rigorous method at all, which is probably obvious, you know, because it is it is so casual. But um, yeah, I, I think that that's probably the best way I can describe about how how I do the mechanics of how I do what I do. The, the rest, you know, it's it's very simple, basic setup. It's one light, one camera. Sure. Uh, yeah. But it's um, translating the profundity of the the material that I'm reading. If I ever get there. I don't know how I'm able to communicate that exactly. I, I definitely couldn't uh, recommend a technique for that. Only, only that hopefully the words that you know, I've written in the, the very casual basic script are kind of uh, approaching, they're, they're kind of communicating the same feeling that I had or, or giving people enough of a suggestion of, uh, of, of what it feels like to read these books that have, that have like yeah. uh, impacted me. That, 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 you know, that it's interesting. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. So, yeah. So you have basically like a, a, you script out what's really just more of a skeleton or uh, yeah. a, a guiding uh, system. And then, yeah. And then you just kind of riff from things that come to you. Um, and, you know, I, with you in particular, um, I remember the, the first time that I watched one of your videos because YouTube was, um, you know, foisting them on me relentlessly. Yeah. Um, and I kept thinking, what is this better than food character, you know? And, uh, the very first one that really caught my attention was, uh, the one for Paradise Lost where you said, you know, read it for Satan, which is exactly what Harold Bloom tells us to, to read, um, Paradise really? Lost for. And, uh, and rightly so. It's a wonderful character. Oh, fabulous. One of the things that I'm really drawn to with your channel is your charisma. I mean, it really feels like I'm just talking to a friend who's, um, or listening to a friend who's uh, super excited about something and then gets me hyped about it. Um, and that's not something that can be manufactured. You know, you either have charisma or you don't. And when you get in front of a camera and record yourself, that's really uh, a deciding factor. You know, the, the camera will show who has true charisma and who doesn't, and you have it. So like I said, one of the first videos, I, the first video I watched of yours was the one on um, Milton and uh, Paradise Lost, and in fact, and, and, and specifically the emphasis on uh, the character of Lucifer, which is an amazing uh, feat of literary greatness. And, but the way you spoke about it and your charisma was really uh, what drew me in. And for you to talk the way that you do about the types of books that you read with still this level of charisma is really something. Um, it's really something that I think has drawn, drawn a lot of people. I, I really appreciate it, man. That, I mean, that that really does mean a lot. And I, I don't, I, I just feel like I'm a fucking ham, <laughs> you know? Like I just feel like kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's really, when people ask what I do for work, that's, that's, that, that's when I, I, I imagine my, you know, my responses are always uh, uh, pretty terrific uh, and embarrassing, you know, cause it's like, yeah. 
<laughs> I bitch about books on YouTube, you know, but I mean, no, I, I, it, it, sincerely, I mean, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Those are some terrific answers and uh, mine kind of pale by comparison, I feel. <laughs> all right, well, that's all we've got for today. Thank you very much, Chris, for stopping by. It was a great conversation, really enjoyed it and hope to do this again soon. And uh, I think we're planning on some more collaborations down the road. And so, uh, yeah, we're scheming. I'm sure it'll be very interesting. So Chris, thank you very much for coming on and uh, take care, buddy. Till next time. Thank you so much for having me, Cliff. I appreciate it. And I look forward to many future collaborations. Please subscribe to Chris's channel, Leaf by Leaf, using the description link below. It's definitely worth your time if you enjoy the stuff here. I believe you'll absolutely enjoy the stuff there. Also, you can find all pertinent links from our conversation in the description box below. I think personally, there's a ton of wisdom to be found on Chris's channel, Leaf by Leaf, and anybody who is interested in literature should absolutely go check it out right away. There's so much to learn from watching him. He's extremely knowledgeable and also just a really friendly guy. Chris raises the bar as far as booktube. He makes he, he makes YouTube and booktube or whatever this whole literary thing is on YouTube uh, a much better place. And I do believe it is time for the coffee lottery. So if you are new here, welcome. Thank you very much for watching. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show and I place their names on this mason jar and whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing when I'm reviewing a book. However, now, because this was just a conversation, you can choose whichever book I've reviewed in the past. I will send it your way uh, as long as it's not rare now or impossible to find or ridiculously expensive as this, this occasionally happens with the kind of obscure literature I read sometimes. But you know, within reason, you can get whatever you want and I will send it to you along with a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And if you are interested in helping out the show and support you can click the link below or go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. For a dollar or more, you can get access to the patron only reviews, the Discord channel, and the Better Than Friday newsletter, which is just a list of five different things that I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books in the pipeline, music, films, articles, changes week to week. If you think we have similar tastes, I think you'll get a lot of value out of that. Unfortunately, international shipping is not included. Sorry about that. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. <laughs> oh, yeah, Ed, Ed F. Thank you very much, Ed. You're going to receive whatever book you want, man. Plus a bag of delicious coffee, and I sincerely hope you're doing well, man. Ed is a real life friend. He's been very supportive of the show over the years. Ed is an awesome guy, so. Thank you so much, Ed. I sincerely appreciate it. All right, well, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for stopping by. Hope you got some good recommendations out of this uh, conversation. Please subscribe to Chris's channel. You will not regret it. And if you're feeling kind enough, you can uh, subscribe to mine and uh, hit the thumbs up if you'd be so kind, as it will definitely help the algorithm get this conversation and these book reviews that we both of us do to people who would enjoy these books. So thank you so much. I hope wherever you are, you're having a beautiful day. And uh, always remember, bring a book wherever you go. And I hope you're going to some beautiful places this summer. Don't worry that the whole world is burning around us. Fuck it. Every generation has their apocalypse. It's all right. It's okay. There will be opportunities amidst the catastrophe. We'll be okay. We're going to make it through together. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.